on behalf of uh, the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development at Devi Ahilya Vishwa Vidyala in Indore, I uh, would like to welcome uh, our, our distinguished speaker for today, Professor Harini Nagendra, and uh, all our participants who are joining us on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live. Uh, this lecture is part of a series being organized by the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development uh, titled Dialogues on Development. Uh, Professor Nagendra will speak to us on the theme thinking ecologically about India's cities. India's cities are on a breakneck path to growth. Cities are engines of prosperity and promise, as well as zones of pollution, stress, and disease. Episodes of flood, drought, heat waves, and smog tell us why we must begin to think ecologically about our urban future in India, Indian cities. Many Indian cities were built on a foundation of local ecology, drawing on the rivers, lakes, forests, grasslands, and coastal areas around them for food, water, and building material. Yet over centuries, the human population has grown and transformed the ecology of our cities beyond recognition. This talk will discuss how we need to learn from our past urban history to redesign cities to accommodate ecology, ensuring human well-being, as well as resilience to climate change. Uh, professor Nagendra is a professor in sustainability at Azim Premji University. Uh, she has conducted research for over 30 years on India's forests and cities. In addition to a number of research publications, she writes a monthly Sunday column in the Deccan Herald called The Green Goblin, and is a well-known public speaker and writer on science issues in newspapers, blogs, and other fora. Her books include Nature in the City, Bengaluru in the Past, Present, and Future, and Cities and Canopies, the Tree Book of Indian Cities. Uh, without taking more time, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Nagendra to address uh, us. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, to our participants in this lecture, that uh, we will have time allotted at the uh, after uh, she makes her remarks to take questions and comments. So please uh, uh, post your comments and questions in the Q&A box, and we will take it after her uh, her remarks. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, give this talk and I'm very appreciative of the invitation also, as well as I think it's a pleasure to give this talk. I've also heard some of the previous talks on your YouTube seminar and you've had some you know, great speakers. So again, just to people here, many of you would have heard the series, but we haven't, please go back and check them out. Uh, so I am just going to speak to you about cities, and uh, which is, I think, when we're speaking of development issues, of course, an issue very pertinent to India. And so let me just begin by sharing my screen. Yes, I am slightly. So thinking ecologically about India cities, what does that even mean? Um, you know, if you look at it, just, just to start with a bit of a reflection back to, to the idea of what it means to think ecologically about cities, as an ecologist myself, I can vouch for the fact that uh, ecologists rarely think about cities. I myself didn't think about cities uh, too much in the first half of my academic career. It's only the past 15, 16 years that I've been looking at cities. And I think there's a reason for that. As ecologists, we tend to think of places which are very cold and wild, but there's really very part, very little on the human on the planet that has not been introduced in influence by human beings. But at least as wild as possible, as in 
you know, we'd like to go to places where you don't see too many human beings, or at least of the kind that you see in the cities. And you know, we like to go where there's more nature, more wildlife, more birds, more you know, large trees, and uh, interesting ecologies to see. So ecologists tend to study ecology as those cities don't matter, or uh, only negative influences on ecology. And uh, people who study cities, so classically books, for instance, especially on Indian cities, look at Nakhon City or Mumbai, or the lovely books on Ahmedabad or Delhi or uh, Bombay, or the Aryan Madras that you have. Almost none of them would talk about the ecology of the city, or if they do, it will be in a very peripheral sort of uh, footnote type of uh, you know, glancing appearance to the book. And we all, I think those of us, whichever the city we are from or have spent much of our life, we will agree that our cities have a particular ecology to them and uh, they influence the way we think, the way we act, the way we behave, the way the, way the city functions, the way culture and community events take place in the city and therefore the future of the city and the resilience of these cities. And whether it's the beachfront for uh, Bombay, which cannot think of itself as Bombay without the beachfront, or the lakes of Bangalore, which will not be Bang you know, it would not be Bangalore without its Buddhist avenues or lakes. Or even Calcutta and its uh, East Kolkata wetlands, you know, no East Kolkata wetlands, what would happen to the very identity of Calcutta? So I think we, we don't think about these enough, and yet they really shape the fundamental nature of our city. And that's what I realized when I started looking at uh, India cities and sustainability issues there, because it, it's something that falls through the cracks so much. People really think ecologically about cities, and even when they do, they almost never think ecologically about Indian cities. So if you look at, step back a little bit and take a look at the global perspective, we are already in a world which is more than 50% urban. And this is complicated, of course, by the fact that there are different definitions of what is urban. Uh, in Sweden, one of the cities is an area with more than 200 people and a certain kind of density of people. In Japan, they say more than 50,000 people in an area is a, is a city. India is somewhere in between. We have three characteristics. We have a size characteristic, more than 5,000 people in one location. We have a density characteristic, more than 400 people a square kilometer. And then we have a characteristic that says uh, less than 75% of all able-bodied men are involved in agriculture. So it's a livelihood, the economic dependence is less dependent on agriculture, high density, large number of people. So it's a more complicated definition, but if we step back and look at a uh, general global definition of what is cities, uh, we already have a word that is more than 50% urban. Yeah. Calculations say that by 2050 will be a world that is more than 75% urban. Uh, what we already also know is that urbanization is increasing and has been an increasing trend globally for a long time. Several years ago, we were taught that India was a predominantly rural country with 30% only living in cities. That number has now become close to 35%. And again, estimated that by 2050, India itself will cross the 50% urban. Okay. Uh, we also see that most of the fastest flowing cities in the world are actually in areas of the global south, India, China, Africa, you know, so the three fastest urbanizing uh, countries in the world are India, China, no surprises there, but third being Nigeria, which is not a country that we think of as urban normally. And if you look at this map, which is from the UN World Urbanization Prospects, what you will see here is that all the greens uh, and the yellows are the slow growing cities. Their sort of urbanization pathway is, in some sense, not that they're not going to urbanize further, but they're not really in that very rapid urbanization pathway. The, the uh, oranges and the reds, which is where India is, are, are the places that are fast urbanizing, and none of them are the kind that someone's having trouble. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments. I'm just looking for a second. Let me try putting on headphones because someone says that uh, they're not able to understand. Arash, you can hear me. Uh, yes, uh, but there's a little bit of disturbance. But uh, you're, you're, uh, I, I think you can try and see if headphones help. Let me try. Uh, is it any better? Yes, yes. App tells us really is that the fastest urbanizing countries of the world are, uh, I mean, let, let's look at the, the urban of the future will be Mumbai, will be Shanghai, will be. Uh, in uh, Nigeria, you know, but when we think of urban and most people around the world will say Paris or New York or Hong Kong, 
you know, they're not going to think of these places. So what we think of as urban is we have to change our definition of urban, and which also means we know very little about what makes these cities tick. Is what makes Paris tick the same as what makes Calcutta tick? Very unlikely. It's going to be a different kind of pathway to urbanization. And uh, as many scholars of city urbanization have pointed out, this constitutes both a challenge and an opportunity because Again, estimates vary, but people say that maybe 30% or 40% of the urban of the world has been built so far. And what is left to be built is two to three times, at least double as much of the urban footprint as exists is going to be built. And that's definitely a challenge for urbanization because there's no way that urbanization is sustainable. The question is, can you make it more sustainable than it is? It's already unsustainable, but I think we just, living with that, can we, can we plan for a different kind of urban? And I was looking up, and since one of the things that some African cities are doing is taking plastic waste and using that to make bricks and making those bricks and using them to, to build the kind of housing that is required, which is also very good insulation in hot cities. So, so are there ways, different ways in which we can envision these cities? The second is uh, really to understand, uh, yeah, so that's the opportunity part of it. So the cost is the fact that these cities are going to be built, and uh, but the opportunity is really, unless we understand it and get in there, we can't afford to have Indian cities follow the same path that Western cities have followed to development, because there's simply not enough water, not enough food, and uh, we're going to dig ourselves into a climate uh, abyss that it's going to be very difficult to dig out of. So uh, urbanization in India, countries like India, are very, very different from the West. It is very high density, very old settlements. Uh, they have a very peculiar characteristic of urbanization where cities grow and swallow villages. So you have you don't have the kind of neat gradient. If you looked at a Western city, for instance, Paris, you could draw a line from the inner part of the city to the out, and you go from the city center to the suburbs. Or in the US, you'd go from tall inner city buildings to the suburbs, which are largely empty. It's not that case in India. Often the inner city might be colonial. You might have green spaces that are more. It's the outer city that is really badly planned. And that's the fringe where you have the high apartments and everything is free for all. And then you go further into rural areas. And sometimes in the heart of the city, you'll have villages like the Lal Dora in Delhi or the small villages inside Bangalore where you have cows grazing or pigs or rural various ways of livestock. And that is a very mixed character of urbanization that we have. So in that context, in the terms of the demographics, in terms of the inequalities in our city, the kinds of migrants that we have, again, there are estimates that say that 15 to 30 people come into Indian cities every minute. You know, that, that's a lot of people. And so if you're thinking of the kind of migrants that we have, also the fact that we have cyclic migration, very unlike what you have in many other cities uh, in different parts of the world. You have migrants that come in for certain times and they go back to farms. They always have elders and children often back in the farms, sometimes women back in the farms, sometimes the able-bodied men and women come to the city. So it's fragmented families, cyclical migration. All of these really make the pathways of urbanization in countries like India very different from a Western pathway. We also have growing cities, looking at this nightlight satellite image between you, India and parts of the Southeast US, uh, especially when you have Texas, you can see that there's a lot of de-urbanization de going on in many parts of the US where formerly highly active uh, sites of industrial production are now shrinking and uh, becoming high rates of crime, they're dying cities. Similarly, in Europe, there's a lot of discussion of shrinking cities and how to keep uh, crime rates low, how to keep, how to maintain prosperity, how to maintain ecology and sustainability in shrinking cities. And we, of course, have hardly any shrinking cities. We just have rapidly growing cities across South Asia. Uh, if you look at, so this is analysis we did for a paper on nature sustainability, looking across the global South, transition, developing, and the least developed uh, countries uh, from an economic point of view. Uh, versus the developed countries. And I don't like using the word, but since it's a word we pulled out from World Bank databases, let's just go with that word for, for now for this. And what we found is that uh, the global south uh, countries like India always have had a higher growth rate in, in terms of cities. That's been true from 1970s onwards. The cities have always grown at a much higher rate. Right. So this is not just now. It's something that has historically been the same, at least from the 70s onwards when we have data. They've also had very different uh, social and environmental contexts. For instance, youth unemployment is very high. 
the percentage of households below poverty line is very low, under five mortality rates are high, poverty rates are high, um, then the penetration of the internet is very low, high crime or homicide rates, low literacy rates, high concentrations of particulate matter, that is high air pollution, very low access to water and sanitation. You know, so they are cities that have to manage in very difficult contexts. And just to give you an example of what that means, when we did some work on smart cities in Karnataka, what we found was largely administrators were saying that if the smart city budgets come, they're going to use it for removing potholes and uh, getting sewerage lines fixed wherever pipes are broken. They don't have money for basic infrastructure in many of these cities. And so when you don't have basic infrastructure, you're planning for smart cities. In reality, what's happening is it's going to, it's going to plug your potholes. It's not really going to go to revisioning or replanning the city. So the social and environmental context is very different in the global south. It's also def very different, which is the point this graph is making, between a Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So again, within these contexts, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And really, we, very, we, we know very little. And we know very little. To do that, we picked up an, another piece of analysis in the same paper, where over a decade, we looked at the top 1,000 papers looking at urban sustainability, 1,000 papers. And when we say top 1,000, what I mean is the most cited 1,000 papers. And we looked at who's writing these papers. In a separate piece of analysis, we also looked at where are these papers? What are they focusing on? That, so let me give you that background before I come to this. About 50% of these papers were global analyses of large data sets of theoretical papers and uh, setting the framework uh, for global urbanization or literature reviews. Of the remaining half, the large majority were from, Af were from uh, Europe and North America. And then there was a chunk, another 20% or so from China. And the remaining were two from Mexico, one from India, one from Bangladesh, uh, then uh, two were compared uh, global north and global south city. So that's it, 7% of the publications were from the global south. You know, it's really, really low numbers. Who's doing the work? That's the other thing, you know, because if you're in India, studying India, writing about India, that's one thing, but if you're Coming from a different country, you could be two kinds of people. You could be someone who knows India well, and there are a lot of, lot of Indian academics who come and spend a lot of time in India, or even Western academics who worked in India for 30 years. So this is not to say that one should be parochial and only, you know, you should only study your country where you are from. Often studying other places helps you get a different perspective. However, we are also largely aware that often a lot of this is done by parachuting in and out type of research where well, you don't necessarily understand the context. You might be here for three weeks, four weeks, collect a bit of data, get somebody else, get data from someone else, go back and write a publication, right? And then what we find is that predominantly 70% of the first authors, this is all based on first authorship, 70% of the first authors are from North America and Europe. Then if you add Singapore, Europe, Australia, et cetera, so then you're really going to about 75, 80%. Another, 20% is from China, and 0.1% is from South Africa, India, places like that, right, from the global south. We also found, I don't want to go into the details, but I'm happy to do that in Q&A. Um, if you have a first author from the global south, 15% of the time they go likely to collaborate with an author from the global north. But if you have a first author from the global north, only 3% of the time are they likely to have an author from the global south. So people from the global south tend to be more collaborative trying to look at authorship with other kinds of people. But uh, often if you have people from the global north studying cities, it's just by themselves. Right? So this is the problem. We really clearly have a systematic bias. We can also see this in funding agencies. You have international funding projects and often you might have a million dollars plus in, let's say, for the US and maybe $50,000 for or the equivalent of that for India or for South Africa and places like that, which means we're always the data providers and they're the theory builders. And this becomes a problem because, as I said, we have, if you look at India specifically, by 2050, estimates say we're going to have 60% people living in cities. That's about 4, 4 point, yeah, yeah, 41, uh, 4, 4 and a half, sorry. 415 million people added by 2050, uh, 1,800 people move to cities every hour, and that's a lot of people. If Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata by themselves will have 100 million people by 2050. That's a lot, right? And uh, then if you're thinking of them and using Western city paradigms, which are the most influential papers to plan these cities, you really have a problem because you come up with ideas like smart cities, which 
not that we should not have them, but in reality, the way we are designed is using these frameworks from uh, which are completely designed for Western cities and taken by consultants and, and proposed here. And they're not implemented in the right way. You know. so, so I'm happy to talk about those again with some of our work. But so with this in mind, we really started looking at cities in India, trying to understand how does one study these cities? What are the kinds of things we should look at? And uh, what characterizes the growth of Indian cities from an ecological perspective? Why should we look at ecology? Looking at ecology, what do we derive in terms of ideas about sustainability in Indian cities? So this is, we'll start with Bangalore, the maroon uh, dot, you know, the maroon polygon in the center that is, indicates the original Bangalore city in 1537, which Kemping came and established. And then it's grown exponentially over time. It's sort of doubled every few years. It's now a city that is about 749 square kilometers and has about 12 million people. But the city itself is much older. I mean, the, the landscape itself is much older. It's an unusual landscape because it's it's in a semi-arid rain shadow of the Western Hats. And it has no perennial water sources. And as we've all read, learned in our geography textbooks, people moved where there was water. Why were there millennially uh, stone, stone Age people? Why were they the megalithic stone tombs in this region? when there was no perennial source of water. We don't know. But what we do know is uh, we started getting information from copper plates and uh, stone inscriptions from about 6th century AD onward, which give us a sense of what kinds of people they were. And we know that they came in, uh, there's a lovely inscription stone that talks about them scooping out the mud and creating this lake. They essentially created water bodies called lakes by scooping out the mud in depressions and connecting them from one to another so that water would flow through this landscape. And so when they came in, they sort of improved the landscape in terms of the water and in terms of the trees that they also planted to make it less semi-arid, more conducive of agriculture, of orchards, of production, of all kinds of other agricultural system uh, produce that they needed. And they were not just created by kings, though of course they were created by kings also, but they were created by local people. And for instance, here are some inscriptions that tell you that a woman uh, helped to create a lake in 1342 AD for the support of animals, cattle, birds, and the goddess Ganga. Another woman built a lake that's so that her husband and other relatives for 21 generations obtained merit in the afterlife. Another person talked about uh, restoring a lake so that Dharma might be to his father. You can see remnants today, even. You know, we went to this uh, Katte or this old uh, sacred um, platform with trees, people trees, near Begur Lake, which is one of the oldest lakes in Bangalore. And this elderly gentleman who was sitting there had uh, renovated this small system, which is this, you know, this water tank, small one, which is for drinking water on this platform. And he told us his parents used to provide this. And it was always done in, in every village under these sacred trees for passers-by to have water because water providing water is a public good. And uh, then they passed away and nobody had taken this over and he got paralyzed. And at that point, he prayed to God saying that if he's paralysis, you know, gets cured, he will do this again as a service to the community. And now he does that and stays there away, um, you know, during the day and actually stop the lake, that particular tree from being cut and taken over for an electricity station. So my point is that your stewardship in many of these villages that you did for trees or for water was for the service of the community. And it gave you prestige, but it also contributed to the village. And there was this two-way uh, relationship between you and nature. So it was not only done for a monetary benefit, so to speak. And so you had uh, these lakes that came into the city from 1791 in an early British map, for instance, you can see that there are water bodies across the city. And there are also these orchards with these very neatly demarcated groves. Some of them are, of course, Muslim um, uh, Mughal that style gardens of Dipu and Haider, which later became Lalbagh and uh, Kabul Park. But others are more uh, protective areas around the fort. And you have orchards of various different kinds as well. This tradition continued through various kings. So Kempe Gauda, then uh, his dynasty, Shaji, Shivaji's father, also and his son, Eko, Ekoji, also helped to create some lakes. Then came the Mysore kings, then Haider, Tipu, the British after them. And each time the population grew, they created a new lake, planted more trees, because they wanted to make the area more inhabitable. And this continues till 1888, where the last lake, which is Sankey Lake, is built in the city. And then they've actually run out of space to construct any new lakes, because Colonel Sankey says that's it, that's the large, last low-lying area that is not inhabited where we've actually constructed a lake. So what do we do from there? And then Bangalore could take one of two folks. 
one of the things they could have done was to import additional water, but continue the tradition of using lakes as the local water resources. Then we also find in a separate study that there are about 450 open wells, not in houses, but open wells across the city, which will also use the sources of water, and they've almost disappeared. And so the lakes and the wells, what they do is instead of supplementing the water resources of the city, they get water from outside and replace the water resources in the city. And within a period of five, six years, you find the entire discourse around lakes changing completely. People start throwing corpses in lakes. They talk about them as malarial swamps, cesspools of um, sewage, sources of disease. And throwing, you know, when you throw a corpse into a lake or a well, you're also spiritually defiling it, which means you can't clean it and use it later. So a lake that had a lake goddess that was worshipped, that you had festivals, is now being treated as, as a dumping ground, not just for garbage, but also for dead bodies, right? So this, just the fact that you depend on something, the sacredness comes also from the fact that you understand how important it is for you. And the worship is a way to keep that tradition alive and spiritually thank the gods. And when you thank the gods, you also clean up the lake. You also maintain the lake. You also, you know, uh, decent it to redo the band. It's, it's a, it's, it has many other implications apart from the worship. And I must also stress that these are syncretic traditions. So when they, when I say worship the lake, it's done in a very uh, uh, different way because groups from all kinds of diverse communities came together and were part of this lake revival. So this is the situation in, 19, in 1888. And as you can see by 2015, almost all the lakes in the heart of the city have disappeared. What you get is that one lake, Alsur Lake, which is half the size it was before. The other half is also gone. Right? And in the periphery, you still have water bodies, but and um, they are now being stressed. And as you remember, in November, those of you will from Bangalore and others would have also read that we had a lot of flooding in Bangalore. And that's because the entire wetland system in this area was not recognized for the ecology that it provides. Lakes themselves are protected, and so you can't encroach on the area within the lake boundaries anymore. But what is around the lake? The wetland is what nourishes the lake. And the wetlands within them, between them, are the, the conduit of water flowing from one higher lake to another lake. So it didn't overflow into the surrounding landscape, but actually had this pathway. That has been built over without attention to the ecology. And therefore, you have all this flooding. And the converse, you know, when you have the flooding in uh, the rainy season, but you also have drought at the same time in the summer because these wetlands act as, as sponges otherwise. They soak up all the excess water and they give it back during the summer. And the Chinese actually have this idea in their own language called sponge cities, which they are reviving now by saying, you know, you must, wetlands are the heart of any city. We've forgotten all of that ancient wisdom. We do have new environmentalism, which is stimulated by awareness of climate change, pollution, heat waves. Uh, for instance, a big protest movement called Steel Flyover Beda said, uh, stop the felling of trees of the steel flyover. But that has come back in another guise now. And, you know, some of these are like uh, really fighting uh, uh, some, you know, creature that doesn't die. You kill it once and it comes back in 10 different forms because you've saved the trees for five years. And then there are five new projects that are uh, launched in the same place. So there's a lot of citizen movement in Indian cities, but I think they're really facing a losing battle because so much of our idea of our imagination of cities is that development requires the cutting of trees and Cities are not the place for ecology. You can have ecology outside. Indian cities need to grow. We are on this fast path and our citizens need to develop. And that development come, will come only as we expand our infrastructure. Right? So you have lake restorations. You've had environmental movements. And they've achieved a lot. But even there, they've had a peculiar focus on protecting these lakes for a particular vision of the city. And that vision of the city has been uh, for recreation, for jogging, for uh, providing groundwater. What is left out in this entire process is like I told you, villages are swallowed by cities and you have migrants from rural areas. And they use these as urban commons for grazing, for fishing, for washing clothes, for defecation, for all kinds of other purposes. And really they, they need places to go. So if you only think of them as places of recreation with guards and gates and uh, you know fees for using parks, what happens to this entire set of people who are also custodians of the lake? Any lake community manager in Bangalore will tell you that the fishermen are their greatest allies because the moment they're the ones sleeping there at night who know if there's an encroachment of this. But yet, you know, government after government does not allow grazers, does not allow fishing, uh, wants to remove the fishing licenses. So there's a lot in here that we are not understanding about the resilience of the city. 
And certainly we are paying no attention to the resilience of the poor in the city because these are very important comments for their food security. And uh, this is something we, uh, we've we seen in many of our studies. You know, for instance, we did a recent study where we looked at 200 women from low-income households across the city. And uh, we found that they knew about and bought and used 76 different species of wild plants for hair oil, for knee pain, for brain power, for stomach upsets, for just daily eating. You know, think of the kinds of vitamins and edible, the 72 varieties of edible greens offer you, which we don't have, certainly. We all use methi, palak, uh, pudina, you know, some three, four of these. Okay? And they are also saying that they are no longer able to buy them. They actually uh, ask for these to be ordered uh, by other old women who sit in markets who go outside the city and forage and bring them. Because as we restore, either you degrade the commons and they disappear, or we restore them and gate them and fence them, and so you can't come in and use them for foraging. So migrants do depend on nature for play, for mental health, for worship, for resilience. And of course, migrants are the most affected. If anything, their lives are the most insecure. We saw that in COVID times. We've seen this continuously. Those of us who belong to a city and have family, have homes, have more or less settled in the city are much better off if you're a second generation city resident. The ones that are first generation migrants are always going to be precariously dependent on commons. And when you throw them out of the commons, that's when you really destroy their last safety net of resilience. We also find that restored lakes are nodes of environmental place making. For instance, migrant workers, village residents, um, parents with special needs children. And, and what you see is you have a ban on urban foraging often, and you can see the kinds of uh, you know, damaging to trees and plants prohibited, uh, swimming in the lake prohibited, cycling around the lake prohibited, any use of the lake in Bangalore. You know? And you go to Mysore, none of this is there. And you'll see people engaging with lakes in a much more organic fashion, for instance. So smaller cities still retain these kinds of things. There are no place for grazers in these kinds of modern cities where, uh, you know, this, this is the standard imagination of development here. We want Bangalore to be Singapore. And so why do you have, and then who is sponsoring NGOs? This is a very interesting set of, uh, uh, you know, anti-slogans. So there was a group that was trying to protest a grab, a corporate grab of a set of wetlands which feed Bangalore's largest lake, Belandur Lake. And when the protesters were there, there was an opposite set of protests saying, we want Bangalore to be in uh, Singapore. Why are you protesting against the lake? So, what does this mean? If you again zoom a little out of Bangalore and go to India, uh, we know that we're in the middle of climate change and we know that our cities are going to be a special hotspots. And this is something that the IPCC report says uh, that cities are going to face heat waves, they're going to face floods, they're going to face droughts, and people living in Indian cities will be especially vulnerable to climate change. And so one thing that we did, a colleague Hita and I, looked at city adaptation plans in India and what do they tell us about building climate resilient cities? And you see that they have a lot of different uh, aspects to them, but they are very, very largely technocentric. Right? Most of them are, uh, you know, focusing on. And I'll give you an example of Ahmedabad, which has always had heat waves. They have an excellent heat action plan that is supposed to have saved a lot of lives. What do they say? That if you have a heat wave, there's an SMS alert, and you're supposed to go indoors and stay indoors and uh, paint your roofs white so that they reflect, which is all good. But there's no talk about planting trees, restoring lakes, using ecology. You know, why, why have white roofs? Can't you grow trees on roofs? Uh, can't you grow plants on roofs? So you have, especially in slum areas, which is one thing we've seen, they also provide food. Chennai is one example where the chief resilience officer is actually looking at this, especially in slums, trying to do greening in the communities there. But most of these cases, there are no such solutions. And they're really... They're not looking at equity. They're not looking at uh, participation. They're not looking at commons. They're not looking especially at nature at all. Right? So this is a problem. We're trying to look at climate resilience through tech fixes. And tech fixes are going to be extraordinarily inadequate. They don't look at the city as a social ecological system and see how people relate to nature. 
So I'm going to wrap up now, and I think I've been very good enough time so we can have space for questions by saying that uh, this is a beautiful art piece from uh, an intern, Rohit Rao, who was working with us and worked on the urban project. And uh, looking at that, uh, inspired by that, he drew this and saying, what should an ecologically, you know, forget smart cities, if you think of ecologically smart cities in India, what, what would that look like? Yes, you'd have the skyscrapers and the uh, people working on their computers, but you'd also have the foragers, you'd have some of the grazing, you will have a man taking uh, grass in his cart. You will have uh, women who have an art, um, you know, selling um, weeds that they have commissioned. You have children playing in with nature. You have uh, a, an artist painting birds. How does an Indian city look with all of these uses? And I think that really is the imagination that we want to inspire and try and talk about and recreate. Because the problem is, at the moment you talk about any kind of environmentalism, you're always facing this challenge that you, you are idealist and is environmentalism and anti-development. I think this is the case of country over, but especially in cities, a lot of environmentalists are, are, are wondering with, you know, uh, how to deal with this label that the media gives them about, are you pro or anti-development? Are you pro the flyover or anti the flyover? Are you pro the metro or anti the metro? And I think that's a wrong question to ask. The question is really, how can we fit in all of this growth while not spoiling nature, because if we don't, we're not going to be able to live in these cities. Uh, so really we're pro-city, I think, to be pro-nature. So I'll end with uh, just uh, two of the books that uh, I think Karash also talked about, Nature in the City and Cities and Canopies, and I'm happy to talk about anything else with questions and answers. Thank you so much, uh, Harini. This was really a very uh, stimulating uh, uh, presentation, and I'm sure uh, our participants have many questions. We are receiving, uh, they're coming as I speak. Friends, please, uh, uh, those who came a bit later, please enter your questions in the uh, Q&A box. So uh, the first question is from Sandeep Khanwalkar, who says, how do you see the impact of urbanization on the loss of good quality agriculture land and its impact on ecology? It's a very good question. We did another study where we're looking at India's 10 largest cities and seeing how they've been growing over the past uh, 10, 20 years. And the, in the hinterland, the one category that has changed the most is agriculture. So what is getting really urbanized is agricultural land. And so that that is becoming a, a huge problem. And uh, you can see this, especially, you know, there's another group, uh, Karen Seto in Yale. And um, one of her PhD students, Bhartendu Pandey, was looking at uh, cities across India. And what he found is in Punjab, for instance, it's almost because it's urbanizing so rapidly, it's really lost its agriculture because you can you can absolutely see that the, the, the apartment stops here and agriculture you know, starts here. And people are, I mean, that's high quality farmland, but it's all being converted and very productive. It's all being converted to, to urban areas. So yes, one of the challenges we really have is the loss of high quality farmland and their conversion to cities. And what this is going to do for our food security in the long run, we really need to think of because when we call conserving, we might be conserving wetlands badly, but at least we conserving wetlands. There is absolutely no policy or very, very little that is enforceable policy on not converting agriculture to urban areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, the The next question is, what do you think is the role of master plans, project EIAs, environment clearance, clearance systems, and detailed layout plans and their timely and just implementation in integrating the growth of the city with the ecology? What do you think is the role of the current economic paradigm of the country, government as a facilitator, and PPP mode being experimented in numerous projects related to infrastructure development in influencing structures that influence institutions and project briefs in including or excluding questions and interventions related to the ecology in and around the city. This is the million dollar question, and also the question that requires multiple theses to answer, but it's a, it's a great question, truly. Um, Yes, I mean, I can only speak to, you know, one city that I'm intimately familiar with, Bangalore. And I think we must have master plans, but they must be consultatively developed. And what often happens with many of our cities is we 
have moved from a, a, a system where the municipality had the technical expertise to develop its own master plans in-house and therefore be responsible for the master plan they've developed. And now we've gone into a model where we hire consultants, foreign consulting companies uh, to come up with these master plans. And it's it's such a situation that in cities after city, I find this that the consultants use certain you know GIS databases to come up with these plans. And then they finally give you a plan that is on A4 paper. And the city municipality itself either does not have or does not know how to uh, use these master plans in terms of spatially and does not have remember then where they are stored. And in effect, what you have is this planning that process. The process was bad. Uh, the plans were not developed by them. They don't know the exact boundaries where they are. They don't follow them. They followed in the breach and not really uh, in the main because they're not the people who set it up. And no consultative process is followed. I mean, the, the what they call a consultative process is often you just have a meeting in the city and you tell people that you're going to do X or Y. You're not really taking their, their views into consultation. And uh, so all of the, yeah, the processes, I think, really require some rethinking. And because the process is not consultative, not bottom up, not even, even if you forget consultative and bottom up, it's not really been planned by the municipal authority themselves. It's been outsourced. And therefore, what, what you have is a plan that is never going to be followed. And so, so I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we have. Uh, what is a, the, if, uh, what is a public uh, private partnership model that is going to, what are the effects of that? Yes, there are a lot of questions, especially around equity. And as a number of people have raised in uh, many places, ecology is one of the things that suffers. So Bangalore Lakes, again, is a classic example. The Environment uh, Support Group, which is a very uh, uh, um, very respected uh, civil society organization working in Bangalore, had a PIL against this, and the courts had a stay order. If not, a number of lakes in Bangalore would already have been privatized. And our own studies have shown that two or three of the lakes which were privatized have really destroyed the ecology. Right? So because safeguards are not put in place. So there are a lot of challenges around these. Okay, then uh, uh, the next question is, what are policy changes you would recommend to integrate nature into the city? Ah, if you want. It's, a, it's, a, big it's a large one. It's a big question. One of the things, I, the number of things that we should be doing, one of the things that uh, colleagues of ours who are from the economics group at Azim Trade University and we have been uh, proposing for a while is to have something that is a similar and analog to the national, um, to NRECA, to the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, to have a similar analog uh, called the National Urban Employment Guarantee Scheme and make that linked to restoration of urban environments. So restore the lakes, plant more trees, uh, restore the parks, make, make it very clear that it is not for further cementing, beautification and concretization in the name of you know, restoration. But I think one can put those safeguards in. And if you did that, you will have real spillover effects. You have employment generation in the city for the migrants that are coming in. You can also have skilled employment generation, you know, in, along with this in every ward, for instance. If you had people who are going to monitor the spot, so you could have uh, science, you know, people who are ecologists or botanists or zoologists who are trained who will go and or environmental scientists look at where the waste dumps are, look at uh, communicable diseases and see if they're being caught early, you know, get, get, uh, Get historians to talk to old people in the city and understand what their relationship with mm. culture is and document the heritage of these areas. Where are your heritage trees? Where are your heritage wells? So there's a lot in that. We have a very detailed uh, plan, which uh, my colleagues are talking to various state governments and some of them have shown interest. To me, that's the one big policy thing that we can do. So we need. We are always fighting rear guard. We're always saying, don't cut this. Don't damage this. Don't destroy this. And we also need something that is equally positive that says, look, here's income generation. Here's positive health benefits. Here's positive economic benefits. And let's just go in this direction because everything comes together. So that, to me, is the one place I'm most hopeful if we find someone to take it up. Okay. Um... Uh, what would be the motivation for locals as well as city planners for an integrated urban rural development which is inclusive of interests of all the population that make up our cities? Uh, so this is where it gets, I think this has to be something where state and uh, city planners have to come in. It's harder to show local residents this. And this is something that Eleanor Ostrom, when she was talking about governance, was talking about policy interest. 
and different things have to be at different levels. For instance, if you're a community or a local resident managing your lake or your park, you would be interested in that area. You might even want to network with others who are managing their own lakes or parks if you find a, uh, that there's a common policy change that is threatening all your lakes, for instance. Uh, that said, I'm not sure it would be too much to expect local communities in cities to coordinate with local communities in villages and come up with saying we should have a coercive strategy. That's the role of the state. And the state should be doing these kinds of planning. And uh, they're often not, you know, look at, uh, again, take Bangalore's case as case in point. If you have the Barakata National Park and they're supposed to have an environment buffer zone, which is keeping the park as, in, um, as a safe zone. And then you also have the city, which is taking the metro close to that place. And so land prices go up. And then there's a huge political pressure to shrink the park's uh, buffer zone. It has shrunk over time from 10 kilometers to one kilometer to recently they're talking about 100 meters. What is the point of a 100 meter buffer around the park? You know, but but then it's, it's the idea of the lopsided development. If a city wants a metro that goes up to there and the park needs to be in violet, these two are kind of butting against each other. And what you really need then is a state plan which actually says that in certain places you don't have metro lines or highways going and they leave certain places on both sides. So you need an integrated rural development and urban development. Jharkhand was is doing some of it. For instance, they have these uh, uh, craft centers where they train people in rural areas to modify their handicrafts for creating things that are for sale. And rural communities get a little bit of income. And what it does is it stems this distress migration to the city. Because often it's not like you need a lot of money. You just need enough to stem those three, four months and not have to leave in distress. Nobody likes to leave their homes. right? So, And they're often in, in a, they have their own, many of them have their own homes. They have their own land. They don't necessarily want to be dispossessed people sitting in our cities. So I think that's the kind of development. If we can have that kind of supplementation, some states are doing it. Kerala is doing a very good job in their Ayankali scheme because they are doing um, both urban and rural employment. And especially in the urban areas, it is, you know, you, you want to strengthen your kitchen garden. You can get Ayankali money uh, through. So you work in your own area, in your own farm or your own uh, homestead to create a kitchen garden, and you get paid by the Enrega kind of, uh, funds or the Ayankali funds. Okay. So those are the kinds of things I think we should be following. Okay, the next uh, question is, can you elaborate on Chennai? You talked about some mitigation measures being taken. So Chennai has a resilience plan, and uh, they have a chief resilience officer. And... Uh, because of COVID, some of this has uh, not taken off to the extent it should have. But uh, they have some interesting plans of working actually with the resilience of the poorest and trying to look at things like this. So, for instance, if you develop a lake or a park, can you also have a, a place on the site for street vendors? Because street vendors are very important for the functioning and the safety of these places. Or if you're doing slum rehabilitation for climate change or for heat waves, instead of saying paint the tops of the roofs, right? Uh, can, because they're often they're going to have tin roofs. Can you have uh, pots on the top of the roof so they can grow their own food? And that also greenery contributes to cleaning up the pollution for them as well as gives them um, uh, yeah, some protection from heat. So those are the kinds of things they're doing. And uh, it's an interesting place to see because they're also working a lot with different NGOs that are restoring uh, different parts of the ecology of the city. And that's, that's something one should watch. Okay. Uh, the next question is... Uh... Um, how can we combine the essential elements of slowly disappearing village life, such as strong social relationships, living in harmony with natural resources, with the benefits that modern cities provide? Yeah, another uh, important question in terms of, I think we need to figure out how we can get more, somehow people to talk to each other more and to have commons living in cities. So if you had every apartment complex, for instance, had to have a community garden where you grew some common species and farm together, I think to me, those are the kinds of things that would bring people together. And there are many such kinds of uh, plans that can be put. Unfortunately, you know, I have friends in apartment complexes who try to do things like these and they report that sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't because it, people end up fighting about who harvested the uh, turmeric and whom does it belong to. And which to me is a sad reflection of the kind of uh, urban life, what urban life does to us. But I also think that when they persist, it actually improves over time. 
so there is a lot that can be done when people come together and and do things cooperatively so so that is the kind of thing i think we need to try and we can't uh, conserve village life because even uh, the villages swallowed up in the cities have changed a lot uh, and they do want to change and uh, we can't i don't think we can mandate saying you know you have to live life this way but i'm going to live life that way it's more a question of how can we encourage some of these things which i think was what what you're pointing to to Okay, the next question is, uh, what's your opinion on sustainable solutions for management of urban green infrastructure in cities? So, two things, I think. One is the thing is, uh, one of the things I think we need to understand how much we depend on our own green infrastructure and communicate that to people. So for instance, lakes and water, I think, or rivers and water, I think that that is something. We all know we can't live without water. And floods are a crisis situation. Nobody pays attention to them in the non-flood timings because I mean, Bangalore's already about forgotten about the floods of November. But having water shortage is something we pay attention to because without water, we can't manage. And we, we, I see then many cities that they start to protect their water bodies when the water table comes down. And so that is something that we need to, to really help build that link. Similarly, if you think about heat waves, and we say this is the importance of green infrastructure in the cities. So that's one thing I think we need to look at uh, telling people our health. Why is it so important? Because the trees reduce air pollution, and if you have less air pollution, you have less uh, respiratory disorders. You know, so those are the things we need to tell people. The second thing is the reality is that we've lost a lot of space in most cities. So we're not going to get back to the kinds of WHO recommendations on how much square uh, open space we have per resident. I don't think that's coming back. But we need to figure out how to think multifunctionally about this urban green infrastructure. When we plant trees, for instance, can we plant fruiting trees? Can we go back to our old traditions of planting tamarind and jackfruit and mango and those kinds of trees that gave us fruits as well as uh, gave us green stuff and were easy you know, to, to maintain compared to many of these other trees that require a lot of fertilizer and, and um, they're not suited to Indian conditions. Right? So I think that's, that's, those are the kinds of ways we move forward with sustainable solutions. Thank you. Uh, how can subaltern voices be included in the institutional planning of ecology of cities? I was also okay. thinking of this when you were describing about uh, people's belief systems related to the lake. Yeah. This whole question of epistemic justice, how does one, yeah. I think that is, is something that is really fundamental. And whenever we talk about uh, participatory processes, we all, well, first of all, very few participate, but the few who participate are not the subaltern. That's very clear. And we've seen this very clearly that, the, for instance, the, the one land use category in Bangalore, which has the largest proportion of native species is the slums. Because they, they have absolutely no space in that non-existing space. They are planting an incredible diversity of local species and they know the uses of those species. And they're planting organic. That is something we think of as a very upper class thing, but they're naturally planting organic. Right? So uh, I think for biodiversity, for in terms of knowledge of these species, in terms of we need to include these subaltern voices more. You know, one of the, the thoughts that somebody, um, uh, actually Dr. Yalapa Reddy, who is a very well-known environmentalist in Bangalore, and himself comes from a foraging family, had, which I thought was a lovely idea, was why not go to the Lalbagh and the women who clean, who are hired as speakers and cleaners in Lalbagh, are actually foragers. And they have an incredible knowledge of the biodiversity. So what if we invert that knowledge uh, barrier that we have and say that we go for classes to them and they earn the money, but they teach us how to forage and they teach us how to cook. Why should it be like Delhi, for instance, where you have a five-star hotel with a five-star chef coming, telling you how to forage in one of these large parks and then you have a five-star meal. You know, they're doing it every day and we, we should be learning from them. Of songs of the lakes, so there are these beautiful songs which teach us about ecology and why, why can't we have a, a singing session where they... So I think we need to figure out how do we invert these positions of power of who's teaching and who's learning and how do you actually then try and figure out how to get them into the planning process. Okay, we are, uh, we have another five minutes. How do we ensure green justice in a poor area without attracting elite class people in a neighborhood? Hmm. That's the hard one, huh? but uh, I think in many areas you won't find that. 
See, gentrification in India, I don't think comes from in, inside in the same way it comes from the US. So I think if you take a slum, for instance, and you say that we are already greening, what, what can we do to facilitate what you're doing or what is standing in your way? And often there are very simple things that are standing in their way. They know exactly what they want to do, but they're not able to do it for whatever reason because of some barriers. I, I don't think if you do that, that uh, elite class people will move in there anyway. Unless a large apartment comes up and anyway, those builders take over and grab the land and then you can't really do much. And that would have happened whether there was green justice or not. Mm -hmm. But I think so. I think the process of gentrification is different. What you need to be very careful is when you have ecosystem restoration, lake restoration, park restoration. That is where it becomes uh, that kind of gentrification that is exclusionary. Where you throw out these people and say no grazers, no fishers, you know, all of those kinds of things. And that, I think, very often when the people who are there in the long term doing the lake management committees and thing, uh, park management committees are recognize that because it's actually, like I said, it's also very clear that it's bad for the lake. It's a very straightforward argument. You need grazing, for instance, to suck out this biomass and take out the nitrogen and phosphorus that is coming because of sewage. So they were there for a reason. There's a social ecological system that you're tampering with when you remove people out of there. The challenge becomes more than how do you convince the government of this? Because municipality has its rules and they say you can't have grazing and fishing. They equate that with garbage dumping and all of the other uses. And so the challenge for us has been, I mean, I think of many groups as green justice. The challenge is, one part of the challenge is the elite class people, quote unquote. But more than that, the challenge is really convincing the municipality. Okay, um, thank you. What, what do you think should be done for provision of affordable housing in cities? It seems that many informal settlements are built on floodplains, wetlands, or other areas that need to be ecologically conserved, which means ecological conservation seems to require resettlement. How can the need for housing and livelihood security for populations in informal settlements be harmonized with the needs of ecological conservation? You know, this is true that informal settlements are built on floodplains and wetlands, but it's also true that number for number, you will find many more apartments uh, built or high rise buildings built on floodplains and wetlands, many more malls built on uh, these wetlands and floodplains, many more um, corporate offices, factories uh, profiting from these areas. So I think we see one of these, and yes, I mean, that's not to say your question doesn't have merit. It is true that ecological conservation requires resettlement, but I think ecological conservation also makes us think of what kind of development we want. And whenever we have resettlement, it's always the, the informal settlements that get thrown out. And then you'll find the tennis court of the apartment, which is still there, and that, that remains, or the, you know, the factory that is the pumping polluted, uh, uh, let's say, pharmaceuticals into this lake, that remains. Right? So I think Yes and no. I mean, I think we need to have housing security and that's a different con conversation which needs to be had. And uh, we need to think more creatively about that, how to build tall, how to build vertical, how to find, how to plan this better. In fact, when you're when the city is growing itself, I'm not sure what we can do with the center of the city where things have already, in some sense, have, have been taken over. But since two thirds of our cities have to be built, I think we really need to look at the peripheral area saying, when we're planning, we need to plan for the growth of these cities, saying here's affordable housing for the poor, and here's the rest of the development, and here's nature protection. That's a better way to think of it than to try and, I mean, unfortunately, addressing what has been done is going to be a much harder task. Okay, the next question is about silos. It says, how can we break silos between all the actors and stakeholders involved in the edification of cities, namely government, legislators, local authorities, real estate, construction companies, entrepreneurs, architects, urbanists, and last but not least, the local population. How can we make these myriads of actors and protagonists collaborate to generate a unified vision about this? Uh, how do we create awareness about these issues and uh, be able to concretely place ecology, sustainability, and prosperity for all at the heart of planning, decision making, and governance? And then yeah, here. And that can be realistically achieved this in the midst of rampant corruption and increasing power of business lobbies. That's the hard part. No? When you have the political economy against you, how do you get 
collaboration. Because I think there is collaboration. There are many instances of good collaboration on these. But I also think there's a lot of power in people and collaborative groups taking this over. For instance, again, if you look at Mumbai, uh, there are a couple of parks that were on the beach. So uh, if you looked at uh, garbage being dumped in the seafront of Mumbai, those areas, for instance, Kolaba, uh, you will see that actually new uh, land was reclaimed from the, from the sea just because of garbage dumps. And those garbage dumps were going to be taken away by real estate companies because that was land. And that land was not in any planning documents. So it didn't belong to anyone because it's new land that's come up from the sea. And what the communities did along with architects, along with corporate groups, along with the MLAs who have, who have MPs who had MP large files, is just created a park and occupied that space. And once you occupied that space, now no real estate company can take it over because there's thousands, tens of thousands of people who use it. And those people are from fisher women all the way to people who are to Anil Ambani jogging on the beach. It's, it's the entire gamut uh, to, to college students hanging out. When you're using it so intensively, nobody can come and take it away. So I think the first thing is to sort of occupy and use. And when you're using intensively, nobody can take it away. And it, it does happen. I think we need to study those examples and find out. Obviously, it wasn't easy for them. It sounds very easy. And when you have these feel-good stories, it seems like they just came together and everything happened. So how did they achieve what they did in the midst of corruption or business lobbies? Mm. I think that's what we need to find out. Friends, uh, we have come to the end of our time. Unfortunately, we had we didn't have enough time to cover all the questions, but uh, we can share. I, I think if it's okay with you, Harini, I can share the questions that yes, were not taken up. So you can send an email response and I, we can share it with the participants. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Nagendra for this really uh, really thought-provoking and enlightening uh, ad talk. And also to all our participants for these uh, very stimulating questions. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this and I enjoyed the questions too. <laughs>